Good evening, everyone. It's very lovely to have everyone here in spite of the awful weather. And I have to apologize for the slightly late start, which is, of course, because of the awful weather. Um, we are very, very happy to um, have Flavia Vanni speaking tonight. Uh, Flavia has been at the school only for about six weeks or a month, but it feels like she's always been with us. Um, she's a, a wonderful school student. She is extremely interested and lively and wants to get involved in so many different things. For example, we had, um, we've been having some classes with some uh, forced migrants from the home project and Flavia has thrown herself into working with the students, which has been very welcome indeed. Um, Flavia did a PhD at Birmingham University uh, with Leslie Brubacher and she graduated in 2021. Um, she, won a junior research fellowship at Dumbarton Oaks, but was in the awful position of having won it in 2019 to 2020. And so obviously, you know what that means. And um, she managed to get the last flight out of Washington in 2020 to finish up her fellowship back in Birmingham. Um, but at the same time, she uh, managed to achieve a huge amount while she was there. She has worked extensively um, in the area of uh, Byzantine interior decoration, particularly in um, the area of stucco, not just as a, as a means of a decorative material, but also in terms of understanding the craftspeople behind the processes of uh, putting the stucco in place, but also in the um, uh, uh, scientific analysis of the stuccos as well. She has published uh, a number of different articles, one on transferring skills, a reassessment of the stuccos in Cividale in Brescia. Uh, she's worked on an ev evaluation of the technique in the context of the global Mediterranean. And one of the things I'm sure you'll hear from Flavia's paper today is the stress she puts on um, the, the, this wider Mediterranean context. It's all very well talking about stucco in isolation and, and describing it to Byzantine craftspeople or uh, North African craftspeople or wherever they may be from. But actually uh, what Flavia has been trying to do is to really uh, take that analysis a step further and try to understand the practices, local practices in the context of the wider Mediterranean to really ascribe um, the people behind the stucco. Um, she's also... Um, we're very pleased to say that she's taking up a new position. It's a fixed term post at the University of Salerno, where she'll be taking up a research position. And um, unfortunately for us, because it would have been really nice if she was able to stick around Athens for a bit longer, but we wish her very well in that position when it starts. But we'll get the best out of Flavia for the next few months. And it's lovely to have you here, Flavia, and you're very welcome. And uh, we look forward to hearing your paper now. Thank you very much. Here we are. So uh, thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Rebecca, for the very nice introduction. Um, can any, anyone see me and actually hear me? <laughs> OK, so in 1819, Robert Schultz and Sidney Barsley spent two months at the Monastery of Osos Lucas, documenting its Byzantine remains on behalf of the newly established Bli British School at Athens. The notes and drawing produced a monograph, uh, which contained, among other things, the identification of the dome and strinkles cornices and corbes of the Catholicon as made of stucco and not marble as previously thought, such as, for example, from the account of uh, the Russian traveler Bansky or the monograph published like uh, one year before Schultz and Basley by Charles Deal. The mission aimed at documenting the Byzantine cultural heritage of Greece just a few decades after the independence. Schultz and Basile's tireless attentions to recording every detail of architectural fabrics, including materials, was probably connected to their task and education in the art and craft movement. 
And this is reflected in the notebooks where the doc they documented stucco elements from other churches too. These attentions to materiality can also be seen in other seminal studies on the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th centuries, such as the studies of Gabriel Millet and Dimitros Labakis. <clears throat> In the following decades, the need to write the history of Byzantine art led scholars to focus on material more traditionally associated with, Byzant with Byzantium, such as mosaics, wall paintings, marble. So um, stucco and other materials were left aside. Now this stress on mosaics is not, uh, it's not, uh, um, doesn't want to be uh, polemic from my side because we know that there was a long lasting tradition and association between mosaics and Constantinople um, since the middle ages, uh, since we know that uh, the Umayyad in Al-Andalus, the Norman of Sicily, uh, as well as uh, also the Siderius of Monte Cassino in Central Italy called um, Constantinopolitan Mosesist um, to their place. Basis. However, while other materials have benefited from in-depth studies discussing their evolution during the time and their role in Byzantine art, so for example, architectural ceramics, stucco did not. Um, il, um, as a result, with few exceptions, stucco continued to elude broader narratives of Byzantine art. It was mainly confined to specific case studies, such as monographs on single monuments and archeological and conservation reports concerned with single monuments again. Uh, and this publication usually provide basic data on the chronology of the pieces and brief descriptions, although they're sometimes very vague. The works of Rolandos, Mutsopoulos, Luvi, Sinkevich, Bazaras, and Hosteraut also evaluated the stucco elements of selected structures in light of sculptures found in the same buildings. Moreover, in his, in his study of Binder and late Byzantine sculpture, Andre Grabar occasionally mentioned stucco elements and evaluated them with marble and stone sculpture. Now, the scarce knowledge of Byzantine stucco also precluded its inclusion in broader narrative on plaster reliefs in the Middle Ages. The end of the 1990s and the beginning of the 2000s saw an increase in the interest in early medieval stucco, so around from the 5th till the 11th century. Um, and it focused specifically on the production of the Italian peninsula, the Alps, France, Northern Spain, and Germany. So on the slide, you can see some of the examples. Uh, the representation of Byzantium in this volume is limited to Porach and Ravenna, so to the fourth and the sixth centuries. Not even Hagia Sophia or Constantinople was included in this debate, um, except for the book of Pasquini that you can see here on the right. The evidence from the seventh and the 11th century in Byzantium uh, in relation to Byzantium is missing too from this publication, while it is covered for the, last, for the rest of Europe. However, roughly during the same years, the study of Lascarina and Caralambos Buras on the architecture and sculpture of Byzantine monuments in Greece included stucco elements next to other materials used for architectural ornamentation. And this allowed for a more realistic understanding of Byzantine architecture and its original decoration. The study also of Sofia Galopisiverti on Proskinitaria includes plaster works next to marble sculpture showing how flexible artisans and patrons were about materials. Now, in terms of scholarship, an exception is also the stucco liturgical screens produced in 13th century Epiros, which benefited from significant attention. Now, starting with Anastasius Orlandos, they were later included by Catherine van der Heide in the volume on the sculpture on the theme of Nicopolis, and at the same time explored in depth by Varvara Papadopoulou and incorporated um, a, a bit later by Nicolas Melvani uh, within uh, his evaluation of late Byzantine sculpture. Now, it is essential to mention that the study conducted by Papadopoulou and the effort of Arta is the only one which employed petrographical analysis, a methodology that has been definitely more widespread for stuccos in the medieval West um, and, and gave actually some great results. 
Finally, more recently, the volume by Catherine Baderaide, again, uh, but this time on the mid and late Byzantine sculpture, dedicates a section to the stucco technique, provided a more nuanced image of Byzantine sculpture. The lack of studies and the absence of stucco in broader narrative of Byzantine art resulted in the idea that stucco was not used in middle and late Byzantine period, or that its evolution during these centuries was not known. And this may have been the reason behind the occasional destruction of stuccos during restoration. So for example, in the Cosmosotira in Feres during the second restoration and by some biases connected to this material. Here's some. Uh, so for example, that stucco is a characteristic of later styles such as Baroque and Rococo, both European and Ottoman that uh, stucco is used in restoration practices actually for reconstructing statues. So it's the material associated with copies of ancient sculptures, such as plaster casts. And stucco, uh, and there is also um, a, an association of, of stucco as a substitute for marble that is also equivalent for a cheap choice. And while um, the stucco as a substitute for marble, um, it, it is true in some cases, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a cheap choice, as we're going to see today. Now, this paper addresses this gap by discussing the evidence for stucco in middle and late Byzantine religious buildings from a bird eye perspective. And this is just a taste of the results of my research carried out during my PhD that is now taking the shape of a monograph. So as in every research, there are still some open questions that I would like to present and discuss with you today. So I structured this presentation in three parts. First, I'm going to present the surviving material evidence and discuss patterns of changes and continuities with the Roman tradition, where I will touch upon the issues of cheapness of stucco. Then I will move to issues of materiality. So uh, the issues that we also have in identifying who was working stucco and the issues of stucco recipes and the presence or not of gypsum. And finally, I will give you uh, some insight into a category of stock objects that I'm now analyzing my postdoctoral research on window transenne. So let's go to the first part. Before we start, uh, I want to explain what I mean by stucco because this is important. Uh, I mean basically plaster works. So reliefs made of a mixture composed of a main binder, usually lime or gypsum or a combination of both. Uh, with water and sand. Other ingredients can often be added. And here you have some, some, some uh, examples like straw, horse hair, and even crushed tiles. It depends of, of, on the use uh, that people want to do. I have to say that in conservation practices, the word stucco is inappropriate because it is tricky as it can refer to mixtures made mainly on lime, of lime. So I will use stucco here in its general meaning, so like plaster works, um, referring indistinctly uh, to mixtures made of lime or gypsum. Why? Uh, because there is insufficient data to say if Byzantines in the centuries uh, which this paper focus use mainly lime or gypsum. Now, the catalog of, this, of the case studies that have denied is now composed of 35 buildings, of which 20 are in Greece, five are in Turkey, Turkey um, one in Albania, one in North Macedonia, and five between the island of Naxos, Samos, Evia, and Cyprus. The rest of the Balkans is definitely underrepresented. There are uh, at least other six buildings in medieval Serbia. Um, and as you can see, there is an apparent lack of stuccos in Anatolia. And this can be actually the result of simply accidental loss because stucco can be removed easily without leaving any traces on the wall. And it is indeed one of the first materials to be changed during restoration or simply refurbishment of a building, such as the conversion of a church into a mosque or the renewal of the interior decoration. So I had to put some fictional uh, boundaries to this research because of the vast chronology I'm dealing with. Moreover, in most cases, the research could not only focus only on the stuccos, but it had to involve the history of the building which contained them, its functions and its pattern to contextualize the stucco ornaments. So my study 
then does not aim to solve all questions regarding stucco decorations in this period, because it would be an impossible task. It aims actually to demonstrate that stucco was part of the interior decoration of Byzantine buildings and to promote a methodology for its study and preservation, as well as its use by archaeology and art historians alongside other materials to study Byzantine architecture. Now, I want to show you briefly the typology of stucco decoration from the surviving material evidence. So we have cornices, friezes, and corbels, and this is an example from the Catholicon of Daphne. Then arches and colonnades used in a different way uh, for funerary monument, uh, as in this case from uh, um, the Catholicon of Iviron or Natos, but also to frame uh, windows, uh, as in the Catholicon of Vatopedi. Then we have uh, remaking of uh, marble capitals with stucco, such as in the Banagia Cosmosodir and Feres in Trace. And we have then proskinitaria frames, so frames of wall painted icons. And this is a case from Neresi. Then we have also self supporting liturgical furnishings, uh, such as those from Epiros. And this is uh, probably an epi style uh, now at the Museum of Ioannina and coming from the Chimesis of Petrovica. And then we have also window transenne, on which we are going to focus at the end uh, of this presentation. Um, how, um, what was the methodology for studying them? First, the authentication. So uh, when they were in situ, um, I carried out a study graphic analysis, so the relationship with the wall painting, which can tell us something about the temporal sequence. And then I also used other more traditional um, uh, tools uh, of art history, like iconography, uh, iconographic and stylistic analysis. Um, but I also analyzed this corpus uh, by considering the pattern of changes and continuity with the late antique uh, tradition, so ornaments and typologies of decorations, the technique employed to produce these reliefs and the artisans, patterns of patronage and how they change between the middle and the late Byzantine period, the relationship between marble supply and stucco, uh, monument by monument when uh, there was enough um, um, evidence and uh, and then try to frame Byzantine stucco into the Mediterranean context. Now the data emerging from the census uh, from the census show that after a gap of roughly corresponding to the seven and eight centuries, it is possible to start to record um, stucco elements from the ninth century onwards. The first is a frieze in chronological period. The first is a frieze found in the Book of Leon Palace in Constantinople and possibly a fragmentary panel from the Middle Byzantine Basilica in Agios Caralambos in Maronia. From the 10th century onwards, uh, it is then possible to appreciate an increase in stucco elements with a peak in the 12th century. The 13th uh, to the 15th century, are actually remarkable for the variety of shapes of stucco decoration and techniques, which go from freestanding liturgical furnishings that you can see here on the left, so two um, uh, fragmentary posts and colonnades, to, um, uh, to mortar-based uh, frames, which were then painted in imitation of sculpture in most of the cases. Now, the middle, when we're going to look at uh, patterns of changes and continuity with the Roman and the late antique tradition, we see that the middle and late Byzantine period differed for the almost exclusive use of stucco for decorative architectural elements. So as far as we know, we don't have um, plaster statues, at least not in the survival uh, evidence, and at least I couldn't find any text in um, any traces in texts. Um, human figures and narrative scenes also seems to disappear in contrast with imperial and early Byzantine periods where low and high relief figures animated, for example, the walls of the Farnesina in Rome, the bath uh, of Pompeii, the Orthodox Baptist in Ravenna, and the Basilica in Calavasso Sirmas in Cyprus. And also this is not the case for Byzantium neighbors where images made of stucco continue to decorate secular and religious buildings. However, written sources testify to the continued use 
of human images made of stucco in, a, in Byzantine aristocratic domestic context. So we have Theodore Balsamon, so a canonist, who uh, commenting on the Canon 100 of the Council of Trullo complained about the rich who decorated their houses with painted scene of cupids of Herodes, even gilded one, indecorously represented, and also with human forms made of stucco there. Though there is no other known textual, textual or ma material evidence, the testimony of Balsamon makes it plausible that human figures continue to be used, at least in private houses, showing a pattern of continuity with the Latentic tradition. Also, um, the Roman examples uh, show, for example, a symbiosis between painting and stucco by creating wall paintings with low relief figures. And an exception in Byzantium are actually hallows made a pastille, which I've not analyzed um, here because they present a, a set of questions also connected to movable um, wooden icon. When we look also at imperial and late antique interiors, we also have stucco coffer ceilings, which seems to disappear from the material and textual evidence in middle and late Byzantine period. However, another legacy from the Roman and late antique architecture is the use of stucco for string coast cornices located high up in the buildings. As in the case of the naos of the Catholicon of Osius Lucas, the inner narthex of Daphne, the naos of the Catholicon of Adobedi, and perhaps the Panagia Cosmosotir and Ferres. So uh, this use actually conforms to the indication for the decoration of public buildings already provided by Vitruvius in the De Architectura in the first century BCE, where he suggested making the cornices out of stucco in public buildings. The reason was to facilitate the acoustics because it, it was thought that the cornice would have prevented the dispersion of sounds in vast and high ceilings. And this, uh, according to him, also should be made of stuck or wood. It should be thin and not too thick. Otherwise, if they fell, they would be dangerous for the population. So health and safety. In some cases, as the Catholic was just look us again, uh, the cornices mark the transition between the straight and the curved surfaces of the wall. So the passage between marble, uh, opus sectile, and mosaics which reproduce aesthetic choices with parallels in late antique buildings, such as the Archbishop Chapel and the, uh, and the Baptistry of the Orthodox in Ravenna in the fifth century, and the Hagia Sophia in Constantinople uh, from the sixth. Now, this brings up to the issue of, uh, of evaluating whether stucco was a cheap material and was used as a substitute for marble because these cases um, put some, some uh, uh, issues to, to this assumption. So um, in, in these cases, it's clear that it was con continue, continue to be used according to existing traditions. The use of stucco uh, next to and in complement with marble can also be appreciated in the use of stucco for proskinitaria frames and marble for the temple on screen. This is not like the norm, but uh, uh, it can be found in several uh, Middle Byzantine churches. So, for example, the uh, Church of the San Pantelemon in Neresi, here in this slide, the later Perivleptos of Mistras, and the Church of the Holy Trinity in Sopocani in Serbia, which testify the widespread match of marble templa and stucco bruschinitaria as an option for the temple on screen in both uh, geographic areas and in time, because we go from the 12th century till the um, uh, 13th and 14th century. Moreover, it is important to know that these tacos belong to the decorative phases sponsored by the elites, such as members of aristocratic families with close ties with the emperors, such as the, uh, the Angeli Komneni for Neresi and rulers, uh, such as Mistras and Sopocani. So why was stucco used then? So there is no unique answer, in my opinion, but a series of reasons that can sometimes converge. So they are the perpetuation of convention from the Roman and late antique tradition, the flexibility offered by stucco for its quick working and for the possibility of bringing it in less accessible areas. And this is valid for the mountains of Epirus 
uh, where we have the Templar made of stucco, because the cargo of fire gypsum can be transported by splitting it in infinite smaller units. It actually helped to uh, save the amount of marble once used in a, uh, in a church. Uh, and this can be valid in the context of uh, when we have the rest of the sculpture that are spolia, very common in both the Middle and Late Byzantine period. But also, it was not necessarily perceived as something too different from marble itself. So on all these aspects, we may probably need another seminar and I don't want to do this to you. Uh, but for today, I would like to focus on the last aspect. So the perception of stucco as perhaps something not too different from marble. So stucco can successfully resemble marble and some of the most famous pieces were confused for marble indeed. For example, the already mentioned cornices of Osius Lucas here on the top of the slide, um, or the Proskinitaria of San Pantelemo near Neresi that you have seen in the previous slide, are still occasionally confused today, even by scholars for marble. But the question is, what was uh, the perception of this material by the Byzantine? Now, it is difficult, if not impossible, to answer. But in a provocative article of 2007 on the perception of marble as liquid in Byzantine churches, Fabio Berry expanded a bit into the geological perception of marble in the Middle Ages, noting that marble and stones were often perceived as petrified or frozen liquids. And this is, this is visible in several sources from literary works to uh, treatises. Among them, there is the description. Uh, there is the description of um, uh, of the Hagia Sophia of the marble cladding on the marble pavement of Hagia Sophia by uh, Paul de Silentiary, uh, which describes the Brocognesian marble as C. And I put it in the um, in the background of the slide just to give um, an idea. And the treatises of Avicenna, based uh, on Aristotle's writing where he finds that the concept of congelation includes the dryness of the material. Now, since when worked, stucco cannot be easily distinguished from marble. Can, then say, can we say then that the stucco may have been perceived as a stone and as a marble after all? I believe it's possible, but it is, very, it is more difficult to say whether this perception impact how professions identify themselves and were identified by society. That is to say, can we say that a stucco worker could have been called or called themselves as a sculptor or a marbler, so a marmaras? Now, the terrain to connect them, uh, so a, a perception from treatises and perception of the artisans itself is very insidious because we need also to take into account the terminology used to indicate stucco workers and the chain operatoire that can be detected in the surviving case studies. So let's um, dive a bit into the terminology. So in middle and late Byzantine churches, we have terms that refer to people in charge of working stucco. I'm not saying professions because the building site organization in generalized chronological period is very fluid, as well as the terminology, as Robert Osterhout, as well as more recently, Giulia Marzilli have amply discussed. We can say that when we look at the terminology for stucco and stucco workers in middle and late Byzantine Britain sources, we see a significant shift in the terminology from the Roman period. So Latin authors of treatises on architecture and on the arts, we may say, such as Plinius and Vitruvius, use several terms for indicating stucco worker, which testify to the existence of specialized artisans. The, com the most common were tectores, albari, and gypsari. Scholars believe that the term tector is the closest to our concept of a stucco worker. However, this is not the word which will arrive in the Middle Ages and in Greek. The word gypsarius and the association gypsum stucco appeared and become more common in the late antique period as noticed by the studies of Blanche and Bettini. So the Edict of Emperor Diocletian issued in 294 and then again in 301 
is concerned with establishing the maximum salary workers could uh, receive. And here we can also find stuck workers called as plaste gypsari and plastes imaginari. Um, they were both paid daily, but the plaste gypsarius had uh, imaginarius, sorry, had a richer salary. And this is because according to Blanche, the plaste imaginari would probably be those who made figurative reliefs, while the plaste gypsari were artisans who molded cornices, architectural decoration, and copies of marble statues made of gypsum. So they were probably more casting. Two centuries later, again, another technical work, this time the author is Cassiodorus, he uh, referred to gypsoplastes active in the decoration of the interior of a house. They were employed next to other qualified workers directed by the house owner. Now the connection of mold, plasso and gypsum can be found in Isidore of Seville which helps understand the connection and the equivalence between the Latin and Greek vocabulary, as you can see here on the slide. Other terms for stucco workers that can be found in the late antique period are also coniate and christes. And for the last one, we uh, may have even a signature in Dura Europos, as Barbara Grostini has recently suggested. But unfortunately, these, um, uh, these terms do not appear in later sources. Now, moving to the Byzantine period, we can find the word gypsoplaste um, in the book of the Evarch in a peculiar passage which lists other artisans involved in building sites and working with a contract. The same passage is then quoted in the late 14th century Exabiblos, and a similar word, gips and plaste, is used in the 13th century lexicon of the so called pseudo sonaras to indicate those who work gypsum. So, from this quick excursus on the terminology concerning the artisans, it seems that there were ways to identify stucco workers or plasterers. However, written sources mentioning gypsoplastes and the people involved with stucco are definitely scarce. scarce. Um, the suggestion, my suggestion then is, if the marble was perceived as something liquid, is it possible that stucco was worked by those who were working marble too, and then define themselves as marmaras, so marbler? We cannot exclude it, let's say. Um, especially if we look at the work organization as it appears uh, from the naked eye observation I have done uh, in the Catholicon of Osius Lucas, where we can see that the people who made the stucco cornices worked side by side with the marblers, but not perhaps with the Mosesist. Now from the church galleries and not from the uh, ground floor, it is possible to see this more clearly. The marble cladding ends with a stucco cornice, which seems to cover it a little bit or be adjacent to it. Above it, there is a mortar band here highlighted in yellow, and then the mosaics. The mortar band is either the sign of a scaffolding or perhaps part of the mosaic itself, as Pelli uh, Mastor and Costantinos Raptis suggested for other mosaics in Thessaloniki, where a mortar band framed and marked the passage between the marble cladding and the mosaics and belonged to the face of the mosaic. The stucco cornice seems to go on top of the mortar band, therefore belonging to the face of the marble cladding, so the opus sectile. The connection between a marmaras, in this case, and a stucco worker, uh, so in this case, it seems that then the stucco worker and the marbler were working side by side, at least, if not they were the same person. Uh, the connection between, again, a marmaras and a stucco worker can also be seen in the San Pantelemon in Neresi, uh, where we have seen that the uh, marble templon and the, and the Bruschinitaria were um, made at the same time and with the same decorative reliefs. In other cases, however, it is clear that the stucco belongs to the same temporal sequence of the painters. And this is the case of some types of proskinitaria or by the release from the church of Timio Stavros monastery in Cappadocia. And one wonders by looking at them, 
especially the one of Timio Stavros, if the congregation considered these types of proskinitaria or these uh, decorations um, as marble uh, or as a piece of sculpture, as their decorative motif uh, usually recalled those made in relief. And this is visible not only from the case studies that you can see here, but even on more um, simple proskinitaria frames, such as the one in the Panagia in Arcados uh, in Naxos uh, and other churches in Naxos, uh, as well as uh, generally uh, mortar-based uh, proskinitaria from the late Byzantine period. Now, Another dilemma posed by the study of stucco workers' terminology is the predominance of gypsum to indicate them. So does it mean that stucco mixtures were mainly made of gypsum? We know that Roman stucco tended to be lime-based. So uh, how can we compare uh, with the Byzantine uh, stucco uh, produced between the 9th and the 15th century? Short answer, we cannot, because we don't know. Uh, the only analyzed case are those from uh, 13th century Epiros, which included, um, which are included in the above mentioned study by Barbara Papadopoulou and therefore Tovarta. Uh, and in that case, it was clear that they were made of almost pure gypsum queried locally. But why is it, it is also important to check the composition of Byzantine stucco? First, for the correct conservation of the pieces. Second, to insert Byzantium into the broader debate of the general um, change in stucco recipe that happens from the ninth century onwards um, in the Mediterranean in general, um, which is basically a passage from the Roman lime-based stucco to gypsum-based one. And just to make a long story short, this change to gypsum has been explained in different ways. So as a return to local practices in areas where gypsum is abundant, then this is the case of early medieval area of the early medieval area around Paris or Mont Nebo in today Jordan, or as an influence from early Islamic practices. And this is the case for Catalonia and Southern France and the transfer of skills from the Umayyad Spain. <coughs> Um, moreover, in the study of some staccos in Italy, the gypsum-based mixtures has been explained as an influence from the East, where with East, it's not clear whether they refer to Byzantium, of which we know nothing, or the Islamic territories, which then should be geographically South or West instead. Now, to, ad to start to address this gap, I'm conducting a testing campaign starting with non-destructive analysis, so XRAF, FTIR, and Microraman, which combined can give us some pre preliminary information on the main bundles of the mixtures, so if it's mainly gypsum or lime, and the presence or not of, of organic material and or colors. The campaign is still ongoing, and it focuses on three uh, key uh, 11th uh, century churches. Uh, so they included the pieces from the Catholic Avosus, Lucas and Daphne, which are both uh, uh, in the respective archaeological collections, and those in the Catholic of Vadopedi. The analysis are being carried out by the team I'm collaborating with, uh, that is Ormelia Art and Diagnosis, Real Near Thessaloniki, to which uh, I want to express all my gratitude and uh, with the support of Mary Ja Harris uh, Center for Art and Culture for the pieces of Osus Lucas. Now, the preliminary results for Osus Lucas uh, um, cannot be shared here today, but the results will be part of a forthcoming publication. I would like uh, to thank the effort of Western Attica, in particular from in the person of Evelefteria Zagudaki and the uh, effort of Biotia, in particular in the person of Dr. Eliz uh, Elizabeth Savella, um, as well as the team of the effort of Athos and Kalkidi and Professor Stavros Mamalukos for allowing this analysis. Now, moving to the uh, last part um, of this presentation, I want to give you just an idea uh, of the use of stucco for window transenne in Byzantine buildings. Now, these type of screens are ubiquitous in Byzantine and post-Byzantine churches today. 
They were made of stucco and marble, uh, but also stone, wood, and some cases uh, lead. At the BSA, I started to analyze plaster window transenne as part of my postdoctoral research called Sculpting Light in Byzantine Greece, focused mainly uh, on the 11th and the 13th century. Uh, the project is still at these early stages because I started uh, um, a, a month ago. Uh, so, uh, but what, um, what I can say is that basically I'm addressing uh, so I'm, I'm addressing the manipulation of natural light in Byzantine churches and how this change over time and between urban and rural areas. Um, I'm planning to address this topic by creating and studying a preliminary catalog of window transenne, so window frames, which are very well preserved in Greece. And uh, I'm starting from the stucco one, uh, that is the one I'm most familiar since I did it for the PhD and now expanding uh, to other materials. Um, the proposed research will address also practical and theological reasons behind the diverse experience in manipulating natural light, but focus on two main set of questions. So how did window transcendent change in function and shape from late antiquity to the Middle Ages? Uh, and this includes also a um, small search in the relationship with glass production too. And what type of illumination system did rural and peripheral churches have because they are less study than uh, elite and Constantinopolitan building? And how did they shape the religious experience and how did they serve the liturgy? Um, now, some, some quick observations from these early stages is to notice that from the ninth century, um, Transenne started to show abundant carved decorations, while in the late antique period they were flat. This increased cultural value of window Transenne, which in some cases corresponds to a decreased filtering light function, can be spotted first in stucco and then in marble. I believe that uh, it should, should this, this phenomenon should be understood both in practical terms, so for example, insulation, but also in the light of the general trend of the accumulation of sculptures on exterior facades from the Middle Byzantine period, which has been noted by already by other scholars such as Buras and Katrin van der Heide, but not actively connected to the window transenne too. This trend is actually visible uh, in both stucco and marble transenne, perhaps mainly uh, outside Constantinople. And one key area uh, for sure is the Mani Peninsula, as shown by the recent study of the marble transenna uh, carried out by Angeliki Mexia. In Byzantine rural context, this carved and uh, encrusted decoration could be strategically applied only on the outer side of the transenna. And this economy in the carved decoration needs to be investigated further because it tells us about carved practices, uh, practical intentionality, which help us also to reevaluate rural artisans and identify a clear rationale for the choices. Now, to conclude, I hope that um, this presentation showed that the use of stucco for decorating the interiors recorded in Roman and Red Antique buildings continued into the middle and late Byzantine centuries, even with some clear changes. Our vision is partial because it lacks the evidence from no religious buildings for which it is possible that stucco continue to be used in a more classicizing way, as Theodore Balsamon complaints suggest, complaints suggests. What I also hope to have shown is the contribution of stucco to the study of the building site organization and the flexibility of artisans to move from one medium to another, or at least to collaborate closely. I really hope that stucco could be included in broader discourses on Byzantine art and architecture and stimulate new studies to have a more realistic idea of what Byzantine art was, how it was perceived through materials and who were the people behind this production. By keep putting it aside, we're missing an element of complexity of Byzantine society. We're missing the evolution of a technique of the people who lived with it and the people who paid for it, so the patrons. 
Basically, we're not taking advantage of a diagnostic material that is there and ready to be used to investigate the past. And I want to conclude by saying thank you to all the Euphoria that I had to contact um, to visit many churches and their infinite patients, as well as the British School of Athens, the University uh, of Birmingham, as well as uh, the funding I received during my PhD. Thank you. Thank you so much, Flavia. I love papers like this where um, our speaker makes us think about the material that we casually ignored, um, like stuck home <laughs> or not really thought about. I'm guilty of it <laughs> myself. Um, and it's brilliant. And it, I mean, it's not even if it's just, you know, as valuable as marble or if we can like, ascribe marble workers to stucco production. But it's important for understanding the material in and of itself, even in all its um, second-rate glory. So, you know, joking, I'm trying to get away. <laughs> um, I'm sure there are questions for uh, Fabia. I have a question. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have a question. Yes. So the first one is about the concept of monarchy. Because the colors there are made in marble, right? Yes. So how do you address that that problem? Um, yeah. And second of all, I wanted to ask you about the uh, liquid marble theory and how this relates to rock crystal, because it seems to me that it's slightly cleany and you know, uh, mm. yeah. Okay. So for the for the Pantograder uh, in Const in Constantinople, you mean, yeah. right? Okay. Um I mean uh, I try to stress the important obstacle in this presentation to promote these studies, but I'm not saying that only the, the all the cornices were made only on stucco. Mm -hmm. Okay, there was a choice made by the patterns uh, each time. And to be honest, um, for example, Constantinople is a very difficult case because there are less examples of stucco, and this can also uh, be connected to the easy availability of marble supply there. Uh, both as reused and uh, maybe something that was abandoned in the quarries of, of, of the Brogonesian marble. Um, however, I think there are uh, the cases of Asusulukas and Daphne, even if they are outside Constantinople, uh, they, they are telling you that people could choose both. So um, I think a padron had a choice and they made the choice according to either what were the craftsmen available, uh, their, their own interest, uh, and everything else. Did I answer to your question? You did. Okay. Yes. Regarding uh, uh, the liquid marble, now the article is, is a bit problematic for some, some aspects, but uh, I was drawn by the treatises, especially of Avicenna. And Avicenna actually talks about uh, generally stones as uh, liquefy as, as something like a liquid that is dry uh, both for salt and uh, and in general for even for clay he uses a very ambiguous um, language which probably someone who is an expert in arabic uh, will be will understand better than me um because it he uses, he refers with the same words to clay, uh, and then he moves to stone, and then he moves to salt, and then he moves uh, to marble again. So it's, um, I don't know if, I, it doesn't seem, at least to me, that he's referring to one specific type. But I don't know if you see a connection with Pliny then. <laughs> Because then it becomes, I don't know what happens in terms of perception of Pliny, and now it becomes in the Aristotelian, uh, in the Aristotelian tradition, but I will be happy to discuss things with you later. Yes. Oh, go ahead. Like, you very interesting talk, and you're very interested in research. I was surprised by the, um, the capital you showed, mm. and the X-style. Yes. Both show the capital, but um, architectural elements made of stucco could carry 
the weight of a superstructure. Mm. It's not, the, it's not necessarily. Uh, so I would like to ask, uh, have you found more examples of um, several special terms? Okay, in this case, uh, the one that are here, um, basically you have, they are a revetment of stucco of marble uh, carved. Uh, so basically the one on the left is the marble one um, that has emerged as a part of restorations uh, made uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, I guess, and then in the 70s. Uh, while this one, I don't know if it's possible to see here a bit uh, uh, the, the fracture. Um, here on the right uh, is the part of the stucco revetment and below you can see the same, uh, um, the same marble uh, capital. And actually these capitals are from the Panagia Cosmosodir and Feres. And at the beginning they thought that they were part of the Ottoman face of the building. But then, uh, um, the studies of um, uh, Bagirtsis uh, and Osterhout actually demonstrated that uh, the stratigraphy of the surviving piece of the, the stucco capital belong to the same face of the wall painting, which are Byzantine of the 12th century. So in this case, stucco is only a revetment, so it doesn't have a um, load bearing function. The Epi style um, was probably from uh, a Templon, uh, and um, uh, it's, the back is incomplete in the sense that uh, uh, it has an internal core of reeds, and this kind of uh, temple are made by pouring the, the gypsum into boxes in several layers. Uh, so when, they, when they're broken, they split in two. So uh, you have the, 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 the one that is visible here, it's basically the front, but if you look the back, it's, it's split in two. Uh, the most likely um, hypothesis is that they were uh, secured with some uh, nails and something like that to, uh, to, the, to the lateral wall of the churches, because the churches for which the stucco uh, templa from Epiros were made, they are not so big. And uh, for example, in another church, they found uh, the steel bait of uh, wood into the Vima. Uh, so probably there were either wooden structures to which uh, they, these pieces were attached, so, but there, were, there, there was a way to secure them. Is that, is that okay? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, does it, okay. Uh, other questions? Are there online? So we have our London Secretary Administrator here, Kate. It's floating especially <laughs> uh, Kate, are there questions online? You've got one online. Yes. So somebody here says, thank you so much. This is very helpful. Does the gap between late antique and medieval medieval pieces of stucco correspond to the periods of iconoclasm? If so, are there any connections? <laughs> <laughs> this is a very complicated question because it involves all the changes that are happening uh, in uh, uh, in Byzantine architecture in that moment onward. Um, I, I wouldn't uh, connect this uh, uh, to iconoclasm. I wouldn't broadly connect it to general changes that happens in architecture because there are changes of patronage patterns, changes of building site organization and resilience also to different historical periods, which then can involve stucco. Uh, but I'm, I, don't, I don't feel that is necessarily connected. Okay. okay. Are there any questions for the audience? Um, let me, I have a question then. Um, and yes. that is, so you mentioned uh, the um, availability of material is easier if it's stucco because you can get it to difficult places that you wouldn't necessarily get bubble. So are you therefore seeing a relationship between material that is in the superstructure of churches mm. and stucco or in wall paintings and stuff. So are they kind of capitalizing on 
uh, using, say, gypsum in a, in a wider span in mm -hmm. the church building than they would have done otherwise. I think the final answer to say, if, if I wanted to say yes, it's after the analysis. But for sure, if you have like a wall painting with a cornices made of stucco and the, the, and the, the parts um, of the cornice belong to the layer of the wall painting, yes. Um, what I meant to less accessible areas, I meant particularly the area of Ibiros, because uh, we found this Templa made of stucco not in the Spodal Foundation, with one exception, but it's not 100% clear if it's at the Spodal Foundation. Um, and they are in areas that even today are very difficult to go um, by car <laughs> because the car really struggles to arrive there. And there are not many rivers uh, that one can use to bring the material. Mm, and I think this discourse can be made when we also uh, evaluate how much marble or like uh, how much uh, stone uh, or marble columns, for example, are used in the same church. And if there is few or anything or, or known, then definitely is the flexibility. Does it make sense? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just to make an announcement, we now have the opportunity to study very well this Vatopedi, uh, for instance, because uh, there is a restoration project in progress. We have the opportunity to study it everywhere. So we have. To Really, a very good opportunity to understand the, the, the way they have done it. And we found, if I am allowed to, to make a correction, yes. the, upper, the upper cornice in Batopelli is not of uh, stucco, it's marble, real marble. Uh -huh. So, this is in a structural position. Okay. Uh, ah, yeah, 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 that's true, that's true. This is marble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we have the, the lower ones, which are decorative, let's say so, are of uh, uh, maybe. Uh, yeah, that's some structure of tiles we don't know yet, and then the the yeah the other one is the, the yeah the, that's true. The other one is real one in the in the in the spring. This the one, room. and then the, the lower all, all the lower uh, elements are of stucco on the, on top of a substructure of something we don't yeah. know yet, and we have what we have there is. It is clear that they use the me me method similar to this one, which mm. is in Greek, we call it Tragica, okay. which was uh, uh, made of this uh, plaster, which we can see what finally is it. And then they cut and they uh, start to make the decoration yeah. or the painted decoration because the coordinates we found now in the Fact. clear from the obvious. Uh, um, walk and all this later um, colors, and we found that the colonnades had a uh, painted decoration. So, thank no, thank you very much. I forgot to remove the 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 upper the upper cornice. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Are there any other questions for Pavla? We're getting all hands off because we're doing our very easy time. That's very <laughs> I think you're going to have a really interesting talk. I don't know much about this possible stuff actually, but I'm not really into this at all. But um, I was wondering if you are able to tell from your from all of your data set if there's a set of hands or a set of workshops that you can identify. And if so, do they correlate to the models or regionally? Yeah, uh, this is a very good question. <laughs> uh, in order to identify a workshop, I need to have a series of case studies. Um, closely located in a geographical area as well as chronology. So in terms of um, uh, workshop, one is the, I, I believe it's, we are talking about a workshop, but also this has been suggested by the Aforeto Varta for the Stacos of Ipiros and the production of the uh, liturgical screens. Mm -hmm. Why we can do that, why we can say that? Because they use, uh, they're made in a very, very specific technique and they use almost the same stamps and decorative motifs. You can do like copy and paste between one of each other. Um, I suspect that uh, perhaps we have a very consistent uh, uh, stack of decoration on Montados, perhaps uh, connecting connecting the faces of Vatopedi and, uh, uh, and Iviron. 
Um, there again, I could find some decorative motifs that naked eye, they looked uh, naked eye from the picture because I can't access uh, Montatus, unfortunately. And they, they look, the, they're using the same set of ornamental motifs with even the same mistakes uh, that a stamp or a cursive hand could do. Uh, but these things need to be verified uh, by <laughs> some colleagues in situ. <laughs> a question from the door. That's, like, that one, that's a joke doorbell, I should say. That's not like our serious intended doorbell sign, but I have two boys, so I didn't know. Um, any other questions for Flavia? Do we not have a glass of wine? Yeah, there you from your side. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>